In this week's Weekly Funny Story Jokes, we bring you our best funny story joke compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you five story jokes, starting with a story about a heaven for men and women, until we finish with a hilarious story about three mercenaries, jailed, on solitary confinement. Please watch to the end, as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach aches. In our first joke of the day, we bring you a heaven for women and a heaven for men. Very funny. In today's jocular tale, prepare for an uproarious journey of celestial comedy. This whimsical story will whisk you through heavenly towns on a quest for the perfect husband, ending with a twist that's delightfully droll. Get ready for a laugh-out-loud adventure like no other. Has anybody heard about the new place in heaven? It's called the Husband World. You can go there and find yourself a husband. There are six towns in heaven where this store exists, each representing a level of desirability. You can only visit each town one time, though and each town you go to, the value increases. You may choose any husband from a particular town, but you cannot go to another town and then come back. So there was a woman named Sarah who went to the husband store to find herself a husband. In the first town, Cloudsville, the sign on the door read, these men have jobs. Hmm, not bad. Sarah thought. But I need to see what else is out there. So she moved on. In the second town, Angel Falls, the sign said, these men have jobs and love kids. Better. She mused. But let's see what's next. In the third town, Halo Heights, the sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. Wow, that's impressive. She thought. But I'm compelled to go on to the next town. She goes to the fourth town, Seraphim Springs, and the sign reads, these men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead good-looking, and they help with the housework. Oh, mercy me. Sarah said. I can hardly stand it, but I have got to go on. She went to the fifth town, Cherubim Creek. The sign said, These men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead good-looking, help with the housework, and have a very strong romantic streak. This is almost too good to be true. She exclaimed but I must see what the final town has to offer. She finally arrived in the sixth town, Paradise Plains. The sign read, you are visitor number 31,456 to this town. There are no men here. This town exists solely as proof that women are impossible to please. But this funny story isn't over yet. There is also a place for men. It's called the Wife Store. It exists in six towns as well. Only thing is, Men only ever visit the first town. Want to know why? In the first town, Blissville, the sign says, these women are good at housework, and you can go fishing, watch TV, eat whatever you want, and the woman will make it for you. You can be as messy as you want, and she will clean up behind you. As one man exited the store with a wide grin, another man entering asked, Hey buddy, how's the wife you got from the wife store? Fantastic. But what about the other towns? What do they offer? The man looked puzzled and said, Why would I care? I got everything I need in Blissville. Who needs to explore further? And thus, men proved that sometimes simple pleasures are all they need, while women, well, they enjoy a good challenge. The twist? The next day, Heaven opened a new store, the Feedback Store, women could finally voice what they wanted. Surprisingly, they all demanded a return policy for the husband store, and the men, well, they asked for earplugs. <laughs> In our second funny story joke of the day, we bring you animals having a chat on a farm.
Get ready for an uproarious comedy story that's about to unfold. In today's funny joke, we're diving into a barnyard brawl between a pig, sheep, and cows. This comedic showdown promises to deliver laughs galore. Stay tuned as the hilarity unfolds. It's a tale guaranteed to leave you laughing out loud. It was a sunny day, the sun shining so brightly that even the chickens were wearing sunglasses. Inside the barn, amid this idyllic weather, a storm is about to break loose looking like a double-sided weather day. The farm animals were deep in a heated debate, not about how lovely the day was, but about who had the worst deal in life. Just then, the sheep entered the barn with their usual solemn expressions, casting long shadows across the hay-strewn floor. The chickens paused mid-squabble to eye them suspiciously. The cows and pigs were embroiled in a heated, who has it worst competition. The cows were first to plead their case. We feel utterly used, milked and then tossed into the fields like yesterday's news. Said Henriette, the eldest cow. The pigs with mischievous grins countered. Oh, but we lead the life of kings. We party, feast and lounge around all day. Indignant, the cows shot back. Sure, you may party, but we're left alone in the fields with the wolves, and to top it off, our calves do not even get our milk. Farmers drinking it. Our little calves are forced to grow up so fast, my poor little babies. The pigs unfazed retorted, Not our problem. Look at us, plump and pampered. We even have our own muddy spa that we of course use every second of the day. Just then, Bertram the bull barged in dramatically. You think you have it tough? Every year, I have to impregnate at least six cows to keep the legacy going. It's such hard work. You know some bulls have trouble dodging the right bullet to impregnate a cow at this age. Then I'm roped into bull fights. It's so exhausting. We don't get the money if we win the fight. The piglets, still gleeful, snorted. Oh, but wouldn't you rather be a pig? Basking in the sun, becoming a beautiful blush pink? Not to be outdone, the sheep finally spoke up. And what about us? Left shivering in the fields, our beautiful wool stripped away for the farmer's fancy clothes. And when we're not good enough, off to the slaughter we go. And when we have little lambs, they are forced to grow up alone in fields for the same reason. They are always so tired, it ain't fun for a mother to see that. The barn fell silent as each animal pondered the other's plight. The pigs, nonchalant as ever, declared, Well, at least we live it up and grow big and strong. I mean, look at our muscles. But this conversation was far from over. It was gearing up for a funny joke finale that would hit like a double shot of espresso after a pig's breakfast. The sheep fixed them with a steely glare. You know why you pigs think you've got the best life? Ever notice how your buddies mysteriously vanish around Christmas? The pig's eyes bulged with sudden understanding as the sheep leaned in, her voice dropping to a dramatic whisper. Oh yes. The farmer fattens you up like royalty for the grand holiday chase, which is kind of like a comedy show. And when he finally catches you, boom, your pal becomes the star attraction of a lavish festive feast, complete with glazed honey and an apple in its mouth. Now we bring you a funny story joke about a man that loves his golf and an ambidextrous golfer. This hilariously funny joke is about a golf lover's encounter with a then stranger in a small town with a hilarious ending. Watch to the end to find out. John, a man whose love for golf rivaled only his questionable fashion sense, think Argyle socks with plaid shorts, was on a business trip. Now, John wasn't one to let a perfectly good fairway go to waste. Wherever his travels took him, his golf clubs were his ever-present companions, like a slightly more cumbersome security blanket. This time, John found himself in a town so small, the pigeons knew everyone by name. Determined to avoid a day filled with staring contests with blades of grass, John embarked on a quest to find a golfing buddy. He started with the receptionist at his hotel, 
a woman perpetually swaddled in a cardigan that seemed knitted from the dreams of accountants. No dice. He then accosted the bellhop, a teenager with a perpetually bewildered expression, who pointed him towards the rusty nail, the town's only watering hole, and possibly its only source of entertainment. The rusty nail was a symphony of dim lighting, sticky floors, and patrons whose best days were likely behind them. There, perched on a bar stool that seemed to be contemplating retirement, sat Harry. Now, Harry had a face like a road map etched by too much whiskey and not enough sunscreen, and a laugh that could curdle milk at 50 paces. John, ever the optimist, saw potential. Fancy a game of golf tomorrow, mate? John inquired, his most charming smile plastered on his face. Harry, after a thorough examination of John's attire that could double as a warning sign for hazardous materials, shrugged. All right, why not? Nine o'clock sharp. But I might be a half an hour late. He punctuated the statement with a cough that sounded suspiciously like a rusty hinge. John, a man of punctuality, unless a particularly loud sports channel was on, arrived at the course the next morning at 9 a.m., practically vibrating with anticipation. There, leaning nonchalantly against a golf cart, was Harry, swinging a left-handed golf club with the grace of a flamingo on ice skates. John blinked, then blinked again. Was he hallucinating from the questionable breakfast pastry he'd inhaled on the way over? The game, however, was anything but a hallucination. Harry, despite the left-handed handicap, or perhaps because of it, played like a man possessed. He sunk putts with a nonchalance that bordered on arrogance, and his drives were laser-focused bolts of pure, unadulterated luck. Fancy a game of golf tomorrow again, mate? John inquired, again with a smile plastered on his face. All right, why not? Nine o'clock sharp. But I might be a half an hour late. He again punctuated the statement with the same rustic cough. The next day, as the previous day, Harry was there at 9 a.m., sharp, leaning nonchalantly against a golf cart. Now, this wouldn't have been remarkable, except that this time, Harry was swinging a right-handed golf club, again with the grace of a flamingo on ice skates. The game, however, was anything but a hallucination. Harry, despite the right-handed handicap, or perhaps because of it, John wasn't sure what to believe anymore, played like a man possessed. He sunk putts with a nonchalance that bordered on arrogance, and his drives were laser-focused bolts of pure, unadulterated luck. By the 18th hole, John was a man utterly bewildered. Listen, Harry. He began, wiping sweat from his brow, brought on more by confusion than exertion. That was impressive. But the left-handed clubs, and then right-handed clubs, what gives? Harry. Wiping a suspicious tear from his eye, brought on by laughter, John eventually realized, chuckled. Ah, that's simple. You see, mate, it all depends on how the missus sleeps. John, ever the curious soul, leaned in. Right, Harry said, a mischievous glint in his eye. If she wakes up on her left side, I take the lefty clubs. Right side? Righties it is. Makes things interesting, wouldn't you say? John, still trying to process this bizarre domestic strategy, blurted out, But what if she's on her back? Well, that, my friend, is when I am a half an hour late. Harry's grin widened to alarming proportions. <laughs> now, our second last funny story joke of the week, we bring you a man that is tired of his wife's diet and decides to go on a hunting trip. In today's uproarious yarn of comedic genius, get ready for a tornado through a rib-tickling, side-splitting, laugh-out-loud funny story joke that guarantees to have you doubled over with laughter. Get set for a rollicking journey into this hilarious and amusing tale. There was an uncle, let's call him Marvin, who slowly started to realize his wife, Agnes, was waging a war on his taste buds and waistline. Remember Marvin? the guy who used to wake up to a steaming mug of coffee 
now faced a cup of green tea so green it could win an award for most likely to make you look like Shrek. Even the cat wouldn't touch the stuff. Breakfast used to be a glorious mess of crumble pap and leftover meat. Now, gluten-free biscuits that even the family cockatiel eyed with suspicion. Lunch was a hearty bready, a South African stew that warmed your soul. Now, powdered eggs that tasted like sadness in a cup. Marvin felt like he was being slowly whittled down, one healthy bite at a time. Then, salvation or so he thought arrived. A phone call from a buddy about a hunting trip. This was Marvin's chance to escape Agnes's health crusade. He grabbed his hunting gear, scribbled a hastily written, I love you, on the toilet paper because, apparently, love notes weren't part of the new health plan, and bolted. The hunting trip was a carnivore's dream. Fatty meats so tough they could blunt a diamond, mountains of sausage that left his mouth glistening like a disco ball in a heat wave. Marvin reveled in the greasy, glorious freedom. He ate enough to feed a small village, his stomach becoming a battlefield with every bite. Ten days later, Marvin returned home a changed man. Well, a wider man. Bending over to tie his shoes became an Olympic event, a battle between his gut and his limited flexibility. He knew he needed a plan, and fast. But this uproarious comedy ain't over. Desperate, Marvin flipped through Agnes's magazines, his eyes landing on an ad. Lose 11 pounds in five days. Canadian approved. This was it. He ripped out the page, dialed the number, and a friendly voice answered. Hello, this is the Canadian approved diet service. How can I help you lose weight, eh? Marvin explained his situation and the voice continued. This is a simple plan, eh? Pay $12 and we'll send you a diet packet within 48 hours. Guaranteed results. Two days later, the doorbell rang. Marvin opened the door, expecting a pamphlet or maybe a motivational poster. Instead, a stunning woman with a figure that could launch a thousand ships stood before him. If you can catch me. She winked. I'm yours. And with that, she bolted. Marvin, fueled by a combination of surprise and newfound motivation, chased after her like a man possessed. He ran through the house, down the street, his lungs burning, his legs screaming in protest. Five days later, Marvin had shed 11 pounds. He was a changed man, again, this time for the better. He could eat somewhat normally again, and his taste buds weren't permanently assaulted by green tea. Two weeks flew by, and the weight loss bug bit Marvin again. He called the service, the woman reappeared, another chase ensued, and another 15 pounds vanished. The cycle continued, yet this funny story ain't done. Every time a vacation or special event loomed, Marvin dialed the number. But this time, things took a turn. The doorbell rang, and instead of a beautiful woman, a giant, muscle-bound man with a scowl that could curdle milk stood there. If I catch you, he growled. You're mine. Marvin, his eyes widening in horror, took off like a rocket. He ran faster than he ever thought possible, fueled by pure terror. Five days later, Marvin was a shadow of his former self, and he lost 28 pounds. Now, in our last funny story of the week, we bring you three mercenaries, jailed and in solitary confinement. But before we go, we would like to thank you so much for watching our funny story joke compilation. If you like this type of videos, then please press the subscribe button and the bell icon. This way you will get notified as we publish new content. Here we go with our last funny story of the day. In today's funny story joke, prepare yourself for an uproarious tale of comedy and misfortune. This story will have you in fits of laughter as we explore the hilarious misadventures of three soldiers and their unique choices. Get ready for a joke that's not just funny, 
but a comedy masterpiece that promises to keep you giggling all the way through. Three Soldiers of Fortune, a stiff upper lip Englishman named Bartholomew, a whiskey-loving Irishman named Seamus, and a chain-smoking Frenchman named Pierre found themselves in a sticky situation. Mercenaries in a foreign land gone wrong, they were captured and sentenced to a year of solitary confinement. Facing a year of solitary confinement, the judge, in a rare display of something resembling amusement, or perhaps just sheer boredom, offered them a twisted form of leniency. Each of you, he declared, his voice dripping with a sickly sweet foe kindness, may choose one luxury item to accompany you for the duration of your sentence. Consider it a parting gift, before a year of utter isolation, of course. Bartholomew the Englishman, whose idea of excitement was a perfectly creased tie, adjusted his monocle and puffed out his chest. I say a year's supply of the finest English gin, wouldn't you agree? After all, a gentleman needs his tonic. The judge, suppressing a snort of laughter, noted down Bartholomew's request. He then turned to Seamus, whose bloodshot eyes and disheveled beard spoke volumes about his preferred tipple. Seamus, his face perpetually fixed in a wide, hopeful grin, bellowed, A year's supply of the finest, smoothest, most soul-warming Irish whiskey, Your Honor. A true Irishman's solace in times of, well, times like this, wouldn't you say? The judge, ever the stickler for rules, made a show of writing down Seamus's request before turning to Pierre, the Frenchman whose constant cigarette smoke practically formed a permanent halo around his head. Pierre, looking distinctly less cool than usual, a feat most thought impossible, rasped out his request in a voice hoarse from a year of non-stop smoking. Just a crate of the finest French cigarettes, Monsieur Le Juge. He croaked. The judge, his cruel amusement bubbling over, readily agreed. After all, what else could a man possibly need for a year of solitary confinement, right? But this story joke is not over yet. Stay tuned, because the real punchline is about to hit. After the 12 months are up, the judge returns to release the prisoners. He opens the door to the Englishman's cell, and the Englishman hobbles out, bleary-eyed and weak, and says, I'm finally free before collapsing and succumbing to alcohol poisoning right on the spot. Next, they head to the Irishman's cell. They open the door, and the Irishman scuffles out, his eyes bloodshot, his steps unsteady. Free at last, he mumbles, taking a few shaky steps before straightening himself and slowly walking towards freedom. Finally, the judge approaches the Frenchman's cell. He opens the door and out steps the Frenchman looking utterly disheveled, his clothes in tatters. He takes a few shaky steps forward, raises his hands and pleads desperately. Please, please, does anyone have a lighter or matches? <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.